Good morning and welcome to worship today at St. John's Lutheran Church on this beautiful autumn morning on Reformation Sunday. We are very glad that you're here with us today. Please take a moment during church. You'll find the black welcome pad in the hymnal rack in front of you. If you'd be so kind, please just let us know you're here. And if you want to update any contact information or if you have a prayer concern you'd like to share, you can place that slip of paper in the offering plates on your way home this morning. And we'll remember those people throughout the week and next Sunday as well. Speaking of prayers, we have a number of announcements uh, with regard to funerals. Uh, first, I want to announce that Arlene Peters has passed, and her funeral will be this coming Wednesday here at St. John's at 1030. You'll also see in the bulletin a number of other families that we keep in our prayers. Uh, Katie Mundy, uh, her funeral will be at a date yet to be determined later this year, and so we keep Ruth and all of Ruth's family in our prayers, all of Katie's family in our prayers. You'll notice that Pastor Kramer passed away on October 23rd. His service is going to be in Rochester, Minnesota at St. Luke's Episcopal Church on Saturday, November 6th, Saturday, November 6th at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Also, Pastor Barbara Copperud passed away, and her service was held last week. And so we invite you to please take your bulletin home with you and keep all of these families in your prayer throughout the week. With that, I invite the congregation to please turn inside the front cover of your red hymnal. Excuse me, before we do... We have a video for a temple talk. So let's do that first, please. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Hi, St. John's families. I'm Kirsten Rathke, the Youth Ministry Coordinator, and I need to ask you for some help. With our youth programs growing, we are in desperate need of adult chaperones, especially parents of middle schoolers and high schoolers. This year, we started a middle school youth group, which meets on the fourth Sunday of every month, and a high school youth group, which meets on the second Sunday of every month. And we have to have at least two adults for each activity, or we can't hold our activities. Uh, I'm one of the adults and I plan all of the activities, so generally I just need one other person to come and help. There are signups on the bulletin board in the lobby, and if you, or if you're interested in helping, you can come and talk to me in person. We are also looking for more help on the youth team, which meets on the first Tuesday of every month at 5.15 p.m. in the library, and they are responsible for helping plan all of these act activities and implementing them. So if you are interested in helping, please don't hesitate to talk to me or sign up on the bulletin board in the lobby. Thank you so much for supporting all of St. John's youth programs. And thank you, Ms. Kirsten, for everything that you do. You'll see that out in the lobby here, there's a pick-a-pop in support of the middle school youth trip to Omaha that's coming up. And so you can talk to Kirsten out there. It's going to be a great day. And uh, don't, uh, don't miss that opportunity. And now I invite you please to turn inside the front cover of your red hymnal and rising, face the cross at the back of the church for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Hi, St. John's. We gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Dear friends, we read in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sin and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sin now in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join together in our first hymn on this Reformation Sunday, number 504, A Mighty Fortress.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For we ask these things for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Jeremiah, Chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Please join in a responsive prayer of Psalm 46. 
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. The second reading is from the book of Romans, Chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
I invite all the third graders and their families, their parents, to come forward at this time for the reception of our third grade Bibles. So we have some of our third graders at this service and some of our third graders at the next service. But we're glad that you're here this morning. Welcome. You may please go ahead and find your Bible. They are alphabetized by first name from A on the left to Timothy on the right. So Tim, yours is there at the end. Very good. And we'll have you gather over here around the baptismal font. All right. And students, boys, if you would stand uh, in front of your moms and dads, come over this way a little bit. That way everyone can kind of be, uh, be seen and, and perfect. Okay. Well, welcome. Well, gentlemen, you are at uh, the time in your life where in third grade you received the Bible. When your parents gathered you around the baptismal font, whether it was this baptismal font here or another font in a different church, you were baptized in Jesus' name. And together with the Holy Spirit and God our Father in heaven, you were ushered into the church family. And your salvation, the new life that is in Jesus Christ, began for you right then in your lives. Your parents at that time, together with your godparents, promised, one of the things that they promised to you was that they would put in your hands the Holy Scriptures, that is, the Bible. And so today, we have your third grade Bible for you. It's kind of an intermediate Bible, right? It's not a children's Bible. It's not yet uh, a Bible for when you're all grown up, okay? It's kind of in between. But what it is for certain is God's holy word for you, right? So this tells us the story of God's people, and it tells us God's promise to all of his people, including you yourself. So, when you read this Bible, you will find out what God wants you to know about your relationship to God. You'll find out what God wants you to know about your relationship to God's people. And you'll find out about what God wants you to know for your relationship to all the world, the cosmos, the whole universe, the creation, heaven and earth, and everything that is. It's pretty fantastic stuff. It's pretty wonderful that God would give us His Word so that we would know these things. Now, we're going to say a blessing, okay? And parents, I invite you to please place your hands upon your son's shoulders, okay? And boys, you can hold the Bible in your hands there. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, creator of the universe, for you have enriched our lives with every good and perfect gift. You have commanded us to show your splendor to our children, and you have invited us to praise you with lives of love, justice, and joy. Send now your blessing upon all of these boys and the Bibles that we hold. We set them apart today, both your word and these young children. May your word burn within their hearts as you open the scriptures to them, that they would grow continually in holy wisdom unto the salvation that you have promised them in Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's congratulate these young men here this morning. <laughs> Outstanding. Now, uh, parents, you may be seated. Boys, um, give the Bibles to your parents for just a minute because you're going to need both hands. Go ahead and please take one of the colors of Play-Doh. And if you have siblings that are sitting down in the pews, they can come forward now at this time too. Okay, so other kids... So everybody come on up front, all right? Come on up, come on up. You'll definitely want to come up this morning for the children's sermon. There's, by the way, there's no upper age limit. You know, I always say that, and I never get any other takers, right? You guys like Play-Doh? Of course. Who doesn't like Play-Doh, right? I like Play-Doh too. Come, come, come grab. Of course I like Play-Doh, right? I'm a kid at heart, huh? Well, in fact, sometimes people would say, you're just a plain kid, Pastor Chris. Huh? Okay, so go ahead and take one there, Anna. Or is that, Car- I'm sorry, Caroline. Very good. Okay, now go ahead and open it up. All right, go ahead and open it up. It's kind of hard to get out. All right, sometimes you've got to dig it out. Do you remember the smell of Play-Doh? Oh, you'll, you'll remember it here in just a minute. Huh? I love Play-Doh, okay? All right. So, you know, I've often said 
and if the grown-ups uh, haven't heard this before, you should hear it uh, uh, clear as a bell today. You know, the, the hardest thing for us to do as grown-ups is to think like children. And I mean that in a very positive way. This is why Jesus says, you must enter the kingdom of God as a child, right? It's, it's only with the faith of a child that you'll enter the kingdom of heaven, right? But it's been a long, long time since I've been a kid. And so sometimes it's pretty hard to think of, what should we do for the children's sermon today? No kidding, right? And I was fretting and, and worried. I'm like, boy, we've got Reformation Sunday. And what are we going to do for a children's sermon? And thanks be to God, my good friend Kirsten, you know Miss Kirsten, right? Kirsten Rathke. She said, well, why don't you just use Plato? And why do you think she said that? Why do you think on Reformation Sunday, right? What am I doing with this Play-Doh, right? Squishing it, smashing it, making it. Have you ever heard of the word reform? Reforming it. I know, it makes sense, doesn't it, huh? Well, thank goodness, Kirsten said, you know, it's Reformation Sunday. Why don't you just use Play-Doh? Because you can form it and reform it and form it again and form it some more so you can make a cross you could if you had um, some time and a tabletop and maybe a rolling pin you could roll it out very thin and you could let the sheets dry and you could make uh, four walls and a roof and a house you know all sorts of you can bake this stuff I think even can't you so that it becomes hard permanently right but that's Right? That's the beauty of Play-Doh, is that you can form it, and then you can reform it, and you can make it again and again and again and again. Well, today, you've noticed that right, we are celebrating Reformation Sunday, okay, when God, who made the church, started to reform the church. Right? Right? So God made the church new again. All right, so Martin Luther began that, that process of reforming, and God reformed the church like I'm reforming this Plato, this clay, okay? And God will continue to reform the church. Do you know why God does this? What do you think, Carter? Why would God reform the church? Why would God make it new again and again? so that we can spread God's word throughout all the world and every time, right? That's exactly right, Carter. So that we could spread God's word in Jesus through all the world, okay? Would you please um, hold your Play-Doh, put the top on it if you, if you haven't yet, smash it in there, okay? And you'll get to take it back to your pew here in just a second, to your seats, okay? And once you've got it back in there, fold your hands and we'll say a prayer. Okay, are you ready? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for forming the church and thank you for reforming it 500 years ago with Martin Luther and thank you for reforming it with every generation and thank you for reforming it again today that we might take the good news of your son Jesus to all the world. O oh Lord, bless these children, and as they enjoy this Plato, and as they mold it and shape it, may you mold and shape in their hearts your word through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. You can take your Plato back with you and be seated. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It was necessary 500 years ago to reform the church because it had fallen into a season where it was professing that forgiveness was something that people could purchase, could buy not with the blood of Christ so much as with their own hard-earned currency, their gold and silver and copper, typically in the form of an indulgence, so that their sins would be forgiven 
and even so that the sins of their dead loved relatives would be forgiven also. Not only was the church malformed in terms of its thinking about how God gives forgiveness, but it also had become disfigured in terms of how it thought about salvation. Indeed, the church was preaching that salvation comes through participating with God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ by doing good works. And if there were no good works that sprung forth from a person's life, well then clearly there was no salvation that could be had. Because Jesus' sacrifice on the cross merely made a person eligible. And they had to take that next step, performing good works, so as to make Christ's sacrifice effective for them and complete. It was in the midst of all of these questions and turmoil about the place of good works and whether or not forgiveness could be purchased with an earthly currency or whether these things were merely gifts of God, purely gifts of God. It was in the midst of these great controversies that Martin Luther comes across from Romans chapter 3, that great verse that St. Paul writes. When St. Paul is reflecting on Father Abraham, and he remembers that God said to Abraham, that because you have believed me, because you have trusted, because you have had faith, that he would provide a sacrifice in place of his son Isaac, that instead a ram would be given, God reckons this to Abraham as righteousness because Abraham believed the promise that was given to him, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the heavens above and as uncountable as the sand upon the seashore beneath his feet. Abraham believed God's promise, and so it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And this is how one is made right with God, Yes, good works come from the life that is renewed in Christ, that is made new. But they come because the person has been raised up to new life. This new life is the evidence of faith. And faith, trusting the Lord, makes one right with God. It was trusting this passage from from St. Paul that Luther remembered that we are made righteous with God, not by our good works, and that we are forgiven, not by however much currency we have in our pockets and what we give monetarily to the church, but rather because of the action and the salvation of Jesus Christ. And so remembering this promise, Luther also begins the work of saying to the church, we must reform. We must let the Spirit work in us anew. In Romans chapter 12, St. Paul writes, Let yourselves be conformed, not to this world, but rather let your minds be transformed by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, so that you may know what is the pure and good and perfect and holy will of God. We know God's will because of what we read in Scripture. This is the first and the last place to which we turn so that we might know how it is that God works in the world and operates in our lives. Were we to be conformed to this world, we would be like a ship without a rudder, blown and tossed by every storm and carried away by every current in society. And where would that lead us? Where would that lead us in this day? For if we are to be conformed to the world, then we will look at the gifts that God has given in terms of the family, in terms of marriage, even in terms of our own identity. Male and female, God has made them. God has made them male and female in God's own image. And yet today, even this, whether one is male or female, is now deeply 
in question by the wisdom of the world. Marriage, what is it good for? Parents, do you need one or two or how many? Or maybe none at all. By the wisdom of this world, we would be torn asunder and without any way to the Father in heaven. But Jesus provides a way. And St. Paul tells us that if we are not to be conformed to this world, but rather transformed by the renewing of our minds in the Holy Spirit, then we will be able to take the promise of God's good and gracious and merciful and boundless love to all the world so that they might hear and trust and know that there is a name under heaven by which all may be saved. That name is Jesus Christ. God is continually about the work of reforming the church in every age and generation. 500 years ago, God said about the work of saying that salvation was not through good works and not through how much you gave to the church, but rather by simply having faith in Jesus Christ. And 500 years on, God is now reforming the church again because there is salvation only in the name of Jesus Christ. There is not salvation in a multiplicity of names. There is not salvation in any number of deities. There is only one God. The God who made heaven and earth, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, the God of King David, who is Messiah coming from Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth, gives salvation through the cross upon which he died. It is said, dear friends, that religious diversity enriches the whole. But I ask you, how is it that the diversity, that the plurality of religions throughout the world enriches right knowledge of God? It is remarked that we cannot be certain about God's opinion or view towards people of other religions or even the practice thereof. But I ask this in response. Does God not want, wish for, hope, desire, earnestly pursue that all would hear the name of Jesus Christ and come to faith and know salvation? A new season is upon us, friends season of reformation. And what is it that God is making anew? And how is it that God is reforming the church? But so that we might remember Carter's words and take the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people throughout the world. Peace be with you as God works anew in your hearts and your lives, sisters and brothers in Christ. Amen. Let's rise as together we join our voices in song.
praising the Holy Trinity, let us confess our faith by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join our hearts for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all throughout the world in their hour of need. O Lord, our God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit as you did on the day of Pentecost and renew and rekindle in all the church the world over the fire of your Holy Spirit and the blessing of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray especially for those in need of your healing touch and your tender hand. O Lord, pour out your Spirit upon Amy, Dieter, Todd, and Judy. Bless Adam, Steve, Ron, Naoma, and Stu. Watch over Dina, Chase, Jan, and Sharon. O Lord, stay close to the side of Diane, Sandy, Dennis, Todd, Keith, and Christy. O Lord, show all of your mercy to Jeanette, Dennis, Lily, and Cade, Dylan, and Moni, Tyra, Mark, and all of those whom we name now in our heart of hearts. Lord, to these your people we ask that you give every good thing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We especially pray for all the family and friends of Larry Zinke, O Lord, especially bless Don and all who mourn Larry's passing. Be with all the family of Katie Mundy. Bless her daughter Ruth. Watch over all the family of Pastor David Kramer, Pastor Barbara Copperud, and our sister in faith, Arlene Peters. O Lord, until that day when you join us too in that great heavenly choir and seat us at that feast, at the banquet which knows no end, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, then, O Lord our God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. I invite you to share Christ's peace with one another. Peace be with you. congregation may be seated.
Please rise. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering our Lord, together let us pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the table is set and all is prepared and our Lord says, come and dine. Please be seated coming forward at the direction of your usher. Please form a single file line as you come forward for communion.
Please rise. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you and strengthen you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, dear Heavenly Father, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray in your mercy that you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join in our sending hymn this morning. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.